I have lost a lot of hours to Receiver. In fact, I think I've put more man hours into Receiver 1 than were spent to program the game originally. Since it cost me all of free 99, I'd say that's pretty good ROI. Receiver 1 is definitely my kind of autism. It's a hastily thrown together tech demo with one gimmick. What if there was a shooter that didn't automate any part of firing a gun? The levels are simple and randomized. There are only two types of enemies, and your character's entire move list is just walk and shoot. The rub is that the controls for loading and shooting a gun take up about half the keyboard. If you're unfamiliar, I'll go over it pretty fast. Instead of pressing the R key to reload your gun automatically from a pool of bullets, you have keys to control every action in the sequence. The R key retracts the slide of your pistol. The T key controls the slide lock lever. The E key ejects the magazine. The Z key inserts loose rounds into the magazine and also the magazine back into the gun. The V key controls the safety lever. The F key controls the hammer. I'm not the first person to make this comparison, but Receiver is QWOP for guns. Receiver 2 is essentially the first receiver extrapolated into a full game. At its core, Receiver 1 was a tech demo, bashed together in a week for a game jam. Receiver 2 is probably the sort of thing they would have made if it had ever been treated as a full project. The story and game objective is still the same. You are a receiver, you wander around a hostile dream environment collecting audio tapes and trying not to get killed by machine gun turrets and flying taser drones. Thankfully, Receiver 2 uses the same controls as the first game, so the hundred or so hours I spent getting very good at operating guns in Receiver 1 carried straight over. Let's see if this still uh, controls like I'm used to. So E to open the cylinder, Z to fill it full of bullets, R to put the cylinder back. F to cock the hammer, let's see if it's F to hold the hammer, and then click and then release F to decock safely. Epic. If it's your first time, be prepared for a challenge. More than just learning the controls, you'll have to learn the operating principles of all the firearms in the game. Thanks to my extracurriculars, I already know how all these guns work, but it's funny to read the forums and see bug reports from players who think the decocker mechanism on a SIG 226 is actually just a broken safety lever. It is peak Dunning-Kruger. Receiver 2 adds several new guns, and now there are enough pistols in the game that almost all possible handgun batteries of arms are represented. For example, the SIG P226 and the Beretta 92 are both double-action, single-action pistols, but the Beretta has a combination safety decocker, whereas the SIG 226 has a decocker only and no manual safety. The differences between a Beretta 92 and a SIG 226 can only be conveyed to the player by a game as granular as this. In any other shooter, they'd both be 15-shot, 9mm sidearms, probably with some arbitrary differences in damage and rate of fire to distinguish them. Receiver 2 ups the ante over the first game by de-automating even more aspects of weapons handling. First of all is the potential for guns to jam in various ways. It's possible to get stovepipes, double feeds, and failures to feed, and the way you address all these jams is pretty damn true to life and can be extremely intense. This is the best weapon malfunction mechanic I've ever seen, and probably the best we will ever see, because it relies so heavily on the myriad key bindings. For example, the Z key inserts a magazine into the gun, but it is also used to tap the magazine into place to address a failure to feed. If you get a stovepipe, rack the slide to get quickly back into action. If you get a failure to feed, tap the bottom of the mag, then rack the slide to chamber around. If you get a double feed, you are fucked, just like in real life. You have to lock the slide back manually, which requires two key presses, remove the magazine, then rack the slide a few times, reinsert the mag, and rack the slide again. For added fun, try doing this while running up four flights of stairs to evade a flying taser drone. It's way more in-depth than Far Cry 2 or Stalker, both of which just have you press X to clear an unspecified generic jam. Receiver 2 also requires you to use caution when unholstering and holstering your pistol so you don't shoot yourself in the leg. If you quickly tap the holster key, you are very likely to accidentally shoot yourself with a semi-automatic, and it's still possible with a revolver. If you hold the key down for just a little bit, it's totally safe. The brilliance of this mechanic is in the verisimilitude. If you're in a hurry and try to holster the gun without paying attention, you're likely to shoot yourself, but if you use caution when holstering, you never will. And in a subversive way that the developers may not have even intended, this shows how relying on manual safeties can make you complacent. If you get used to holstering the 1911 carelessly because you rely on the manual safety instead of holster discipline, you might screw up on the next level when you're back to using a Glock. 
Are the jams and accidental discharge mechanics overblown? Of course they are, but that's how it has to be to make for good gameplay mechanics. If the Glock 17 in Receiver jammed as much as it does in real life, it would literally not be worth including the mechanic at all. The game hand waves it by saying that guns in the dream world aren't always perfect copies, because the mind kill degraded your ability to conjure them into existence. That's a fine workaround. Alternatively, they could have just said it's a fucking video game, deal with it. I kind of gather that these inclusions are a bit controversial, but they make total sense to me. The whole point of Receiver is that the game doesn't automate any part of shooting a gun. It doesn't automate loading and battery of arms, so if you're committed to the gimmick, it shouldn't automate trigger discipline and careful reholstering either. The only other real gameplay addition is the half-baked suicide mechanic. Some of the tapes you collect are depressing suicide notes, and when you pick one of those up, you have to quickly unload your gun and throw away your ammo before your character gets too sad and tries to shoot himself. I'm sure this will resonate with some players. I think it's pretty tasteful, and I have no objection to Wolfire paying lip service to the issue of firearms-related suicide. As with the entire game, they have a nuanced, reasonably nonpartisan approach to it. As for me, I am usually wearing a firearm on my person. Right now, it's a Beretta Nano, if you're curious. And I have to step around a pile of guns on my way to the bathroom, so firearms are not scary to me. The presence of a gun in my house is not threatening, any more than a kitchen knife or a table saw and I'm way more likely to hurt myself with a table saw than a Glock. I will say that if you are the kind of person who is afraid of guns or finds the themes of suicide in Receiver 2 impactful, firearms ownership may not be right for you. For everyone else, I can see Receiver 2 being a gateway to firearms ownership to an even greater degree than the games like GoldenEye and Rainbow Six that got me into guns 20 years ago. If you want advice on this subject, please feel free to ask me, either here on YouTube or on Discord. That's what I'm here for. Okay, back to the game. Receiver 1 was a bit of a roguelite. The map in your starting gear was randomized every time, and your goal was to collect 10 tapes to win the game. You're pretty much supposed to die and play it over again, and the replay value comes from the mechanically satisfying weapon controls and the different starting guns. Receiver 2 is broken up into shorter gameplay snippets. You collect a few tapes on each level to rank up and progress to the next map. As you level up, you unlock more guns, the enemies get upgraded and more numerous, and ammunition and tapes get harder to find. The progression system makes the game a little more satisfying than the first, and also sidesteps a major problem the first game had, wherein, as the size of the map ballooned and the enemy count went up, performance and frame rates would bottom out. Getting all 10 tapes in Receiver 1 required you to do battle with your own computer hardware as much as the enemies. Unfortunately, when you die in Receiver 2 or when you quit the game, you're demoted to the previous level, so if you die at level 3, you have to replay level 2 and find all the tapes again before you can even take another pass at level 3. This mechanic is frustrating and unnecessary, in large part because the randomized start gear can screw you over and turn a potential run into a throwaway. In Receiver 2, you can start a level with a revolver that has a few blocked chambers or a semi-auto with a partially blocked magazine. You can find more magazines later in the level, but if you have a detective special with only 4 out of 6 operating chambers, that fucks you over for the entire level. Might as well kill yourself to re-roll the gear, except you'll get demoted. It's not the end of the world. If you're patient and careful, you can get through to the end, and your reward for beating the game isn't so spectacular that you should lose sleep over it. Even so, the demotion mechanic should probably just be removed from the game because it adds literally nothing other than runtime. And it kills my enthusiasm to be forced to suffer through a whole level using a 66% functional snub nose. Get the fuck out of here with that shit. Receiver 2 also has some collectible floppy disks and stuff that expand the lore of the game a bit, plus there are way more tapes to listen to than in the first game, although you'll probably still hear most of them more than once. The tapes have a lot to say on the subject of firearms, from history to safety to tactical advice, the last of which is a little concerning. What Receiver 2 has to say about gun safety is pretty much nonpartisan and generally practical. For example, use a proper holster, don't carry a gun in your waistband, and don't carry small of back. Several tapes are also devoted to Jeff Cooper's Four Rules of Gun Safety. What it sounds like to me is someone who has an academic interest in firearms, but not a practical one, and the result is that they did a lot of research and pretty much just shuttled it along directly to you, the player, without really understanding the why of it. For example, the tape about overpenetration of interior walls. This tape starts off great, telling you about how many sheets of drywall a 9mm will go through. I've tested this, by the way. I shot eight sheets of drywall with a hearing safe powderless 22 long rifle cartridge, and it went through all of them without showing signs of stopping. Drywall is basically talcum powder and newsprint, so you can't expect it to stop much. 
However, the tape goes on to recommend a pump-action shotgun loaded with small buckshot or large birdshot for home defense. That's an idea which you can find discredited across pretty much the entire internet. Obviously, the game starts with a disclaimer saying none of this advice should be taken seriously, so hopefully players will treat Receiver 2 as entertainment only, and if they need practical firearms advice, they can watch a few Paul Harrell videos. So do I like Receiver 2? Fuck yes. The first Receiver was pretty much a tech demo, but Receiver 2 is the fully realized game built on that framework. I didn't even know I wanted this so bad until I was already playing it. Yes, your character takes way too much fall damage. Yes, he limp wrists his gun too much and blinks every time he takes a shot. Maybe he's a fresh-faced receiver initiate with glass shins and noodle arms, I don't know. It doesn't matter because this is how the game is and it's all built to work around it. If you really want to see the ending, you should be able to get there, and if you don't give a shit, you can still enjoy the sandbox and the clever little mechanics. I, for one, will literally never get tired of sprint jumping my character through a plate glass window. And yeah, all the gun shit is good too. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Oh, look at that. That's what I look like? No wonder they're trying to shoot me. Can't blame them. It's only natural. Ooh. Oh, there's an arcade in there. Oh, fuck. I'm a 90s kid. I love arcades. Floppy disks, arcades. This game understands my generation.